I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to scientist and science communicator Dr Anna Zachrisson about green roofs, particularly with regard to their use in urban areas and the important role they can play in water management. Amongst other things, we talk about the functions these roofs can perform, whether they can work in rural as well as urban situations, how self-sustaining we should expect the plants on green roofs to be, and if they're always the best solution. Anna begins by describing the work she does. Well, so I'm a biologist, really, by trade, um, but... um but we work uh, very, very much with stormwater management on, on green roof. Um, so basically, Green Roof Diagnostic is an independent uh, testing research institute for green roofs. Um, it's private, privately funded, but um, we chose that way to operate because it basically means that we are much more fast to respond to, to different things. Uh, I've worked in, in um, academic research for a very long time, and I'm very well aware of the, the the long periods of time it takes between you having an idea and actually getting to test or or um, really do that idea. So um, we have tested about um, three years now. We have long data series uh, for for different types of uh, green roof profiles and also the different layers and the profiles. Um, we've done uh, retention testing and also detention testing. I think we did test 1,200 last week or something like that. And uh, But it's, it's amazingly fun work, and the team is uh, really, really good. Um, our CEO, uh, Brad Garner, as well, is just doing fantastic work. And, and it's just really super, super fun uh, to really get some, some data out of these these uh, green roofs and, and to see you know what works and what doesn't work and what could be improved. and and really be data driven in in how we approach that and you know we don't develop any products and stuff like that so anyone could really send in things for us to test as well so we have a lot of um companies sending in their profiles or you know requests of testing certain things and uh yeah we, we do that and then send the results over as well and then and then we perform some some of our own research as well that is meant for for academic publication. We do a lot of um, hydrologic modeling with our um, uh, PhD hydrologist Scott Jeffers and work together with University of Sheffield to to do some physical modeling of these systems as well and have a PhD student there um, who works on this. So yeah, that's basically <clears throat> basically it. Um, but I operate in Europe. Yeah, I presume you test green roofs that could be applied anywhere in the world. So do you have to replicate the conditions of where these roofs would be would be situated? Yeah, so so for the detention testing, it's basically in a rain laboratory. So we test um, certain storm durations and certain storm intensities, and then we can measure the um, the uh, the, uh, the reduction in the peak outflow and the delay in peak outflow. And uh, so, so that's basically how those t- t- tests are done. And then for the retention testing, we have outdoor platforms that are basically positioned on lysimeters um, that are that are weighed. Basically, we have some tipping buckets as well to make sure that they're they're really um, uh, that that the data we get out is really um, reliable. And we have um, new platforms now being built in, or I think they're actually ready to go online in, in Australia as well. And um, we were working on some in in a few a few locations in Europe and, and possibly also Singapore now. So we'll we'll see we'll see what's going on. But um, yeah, so for retention testing, of course, you know you need to make sure that it's the right the right climate and actually done outdoors to actually get some proper proper data for it. Yeah, the, the detention testing it's it's more like um, physical in that sense. So that uh, that can be done in a in a rain laboratory. And what is detention testing? I'm guessing retention is to do with retaining water. But what's detention? Yeah. So um, retention is basically the the water that disappears as vapor from from the roof that never becomes runoff. Um, so green roofs in general are um, really really good at uh, retaining water. So over the course of a year, they can perhaps retain fifty or even sixty or in some cases even more um, of of the um, um, of the annual precipitation volume. And that is uh, fantastic because you're basically reducing the um, the, the load on on the sewage treatment plants, etc. 
um, for detention that's basically dealing with the water that becomes runoff. So, so if a, a green roof is already soaked or it's already wet, it's a bit like a bath sponge um, that is, has been completely soaked and wet. It can basically no longer um, absorb any water. Uh, so one drop in, this basically becomes a pipeline. So one drop in is one drop out. And detention is about delaying that outflow so that, you know, if you have a super intense storm, you have a massive runoff peak um, that can basically overload the sewage systems and cause ecological and economic damage and floods and stuff like that. Um, so if you can delay that outflow, um, the, the peak outflow, basically, you can basically um, allow the sewage systems on your on your um, on your property, your um, area, to to empty out before the water from from the roof empties out. So that means basically that you don't have that flash flood into into the sewers. So it's basically a stormwater management tool, um, a bit like similar to to like a bioretention uh, cell or or a, a tank that basically fills up, and then you have a restricted orifice, basically, that lets it out at a reliable um, outflow rate. So basically, you can control it that way. And are you testing the quality of the water? Because I'm assuming once it's gone through the green roof system, you then have to check that it's not coming out, the water's not coming out with any anything that you don't want it to come out with, you know, contaminants or, or anything that might get into the drainage system. Yeah, so so nutrient testing is um is a bit my my area of expertise. Uh, so this is this is this is the next step that we're um building up now. To um, we've done some nutrient testing and then the pollutant testing in the past. Um, and uh, yeah, so so this is this is something that we are working on right now as well um, on different systems. Um, because as I said, it's really interesting to see um, what is going on. The literature as of now um, is a little bit. Some some uh, publications say that like, green roofs basically are are um, um, not um, giving off that much, uh, not leaking that much uh, nutrients, and other papers say that they leak a little bit more. But um, in total, I think it's important to remember also that you know if you have precipitation that floods on roofs, it takes with them a lot of pollutants from from a bare roof as well, and flushes down. And then you have one hundred percent of the rain coming down at street level. If you have a green roof at least 50% of the water over a year, uh, or maybe even 60, will never actually even hit the street. So even if you might have a small increase in nutrient leakage uh, compared to a, a bare roof, um, it, it might actually not be that uh, serious because you have half of the volume coming down. So, so the load might not be that different. So um, these are the things that we look at as well and to, to, to really get some good data and numbers and um uh, but that's also very specific of what kind of soil media are you using um we have some indications of using certain materials in the green roof profile can also act as a little bit of a filter so you don't get the the the, the uh, suspended solids basically passing through and and ending up on the street so there there are many different systems out there that are appear to be quite good in at least uh capturing a lot of these um these pollutants uh, but then, of course, uh, the goal is to make sure that the systems are developed even further to, you know, it's not like we can sit there and going, yeah, the systems are perfect. Um, no, we should aim to to make sure that they get better and better and better and um, so that we can really green our cities in the future. And uh, for that, we need data. <laughs> yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. And are you just testing in terms of um, water mitigation effects or are you testing the other positive effects that green roofs can have? So um, right now, we are very much focusing on the hydrological aspects, um, retention and detention. That's basically been the, the sort of first phase of um, how we have built up the lab and what uh, the capacities that we have to actually <clears throat> handle the data. Uh, it's been quite big. Uh, I mean, it's been a, a, a massive uh, piece of work to to model these uh, the system and also to develop like new new standards and look at the old standards how um, the the standards are defined in order to to show if we move show uh, have have retention and detention if they actually work in real life scenarios um, etc. So that's one thing that we look at and and uh, we've been focused on very very much. But there are other aspects as well and that. 
for example, energy aspects that could be very, very interesting to, to look at. And, and for that, we have some uh, interesting things in the work as well with some, uh, with some partners that uh, we hope to to look into a little bit further. Um, which is um, uh, green roofs. Uh, if, if you have a city and it basically is just stone and asphalt, you have extreme um, temperature fluctuations on uh, in the city um, from from night and day and, and, and such. You, you can also get these extreme uh, heat island effects, the urban heat island effects. That basically means that the city is heating up uh, immensely. You can have temperature differences of, of uh, 50 degrees between like a really, really heated pavement and, and a green area. And adding back greenery into the cities in the form of parks or um, uh, just uh, even uh, you know, green roofs or, or green walls or whatever greenery you, you can add back, um, it basically cools the city due to the uh, evapotranspiration, the, the water that basically the, the, the plants um, the evaporation process, basically, from from the the green surfaces, but also the the transpiration process of the plants, that basically cools the city. So that that is very very interesting to look at that part of the energy aspect. But it's also interesting to look at the energy saving aspects. Can uh, can the green roofs actually buffer? Well, we know they can, but you know, to to what extent do green roofs um, really buffer? Um, the um, yeah, can you basically lower the um, cost for for cooling of a a house um, if you put on a green roof? Uh, can that roof basically cool that much that you can get get down the cooling? And we we know that it can, uh, but we would like to to look more into to these aspects a bit um, to um, yeah to to just get a little bit more data. Um, but as I said, you know there, there has been a lot of research. I know that. University of Ljubljana has done some really um, interesting research in, in collaboration with uh, Urbanscape and Knauf, um, um regarding energy aspects. But uh, yeah, so that's another thing that we'd like to look into as well. Obviously, in cities and suburban areas, you've got a lot of buildings. Um, but I did wonder, are green roofs, or could they be, of benefit in rural areas too? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it sort of. Um, I think I think the first thing you need to really make sure to um, be clear about is why do you want to build the green roof? Uh, there can be um, there are so many different types of green roofs on the market, and and many of them have um, different um, strengths and and weaknesses. So the the first step is: Do I want to have the green roof for stormwater control? Do I want to have the the green roof because I I want to you know there's there are some some requirements from from the city do I do I do it for for pure aesthetic purposes I mean this is an absolutely valid point because just look at these uh, um, roof gardens for example uh, I mean they they can look amazing or even even these extensive green roofs with with the the sediums or or um, or other plants I think they can look really really amazing so. Um, so it really depends on on why uh, why do you want to to uh, build the green roof? So now, if you're in a in a city in an urban area, um, stormwater management can be very very costly. For example, in New York City, you have the big tanks underneath the houses. So if you can start managing your stormwater with a de- detention type uh, green roof on on top of the roof, basically that means that you can reduce or completely remove the tanks underneath the building and and use that to to maybe build a fitness center or parking space. You know how expensive parking spaces are in New York City. It's crazy. So basically, this creates an ROI that pays for for the roof um, in, in a very short time. Now, this is not the case maybe in, in a rural area where you can maybe very inexpensively buy, uh, build a, a, a big bioretention or detention pond outside. So, so you might not have that that return of investment in a rural area. So um, so that is one aspect. So so if you're building for, for stormwater management, of course you can you can do it for, for a green roof. Um, you can you can build a green roof of course if you want to but <clears throat> you might not have the same return of investment in a rural area. But if you want to do it for, for aesthetic purposes or because you actually want to use the roof for something that is is you know a nice garden or or whatever then then of course uh, 
<laughs> you know, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to also have in rural areas. But uh, we should be very clear on on where the return on investment is, and and actually look at those things as well. Because I mean, it's not it's not just a small hobby project, maybe to build a uh, a green roof on a on a larger building. Um, so um, I think it's it's very important to have that discussion with with potential clients, et cetera, that uh, they, they really have a good think about why do I build it? You know, what type of green roof would be the most optimal here? What profile is the most optimal for my cli- uh, climate? Um, um, we've developed a few tools as well that, uh, that you, can, you can use for that to check out, you know, your local climate and see, you know, what, what's the difference between adding a little bit of mineral wool or removing a bit of soil or doing this and that. And then you can see uh, the level of plant stress that, that will... Um, will happen during the summer, for example. And then you know a bit like, okay, do I need to irrigate? Do I can I get out of irrigation or, you know, things like that. But that that's basically the main difference between rural and, and urban areas as I see it. Yeah, thinking about irrigation, how difficult is it to find plants that can cope with stormwater and still cope when there's periods of a drought? Um and I'm wondering if 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 we don't find plants that can cope in these two extremes, then are we offsetting positive benefits by needing to irrigate during periods of of, of dry and drought and dryness? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question. So um, seed and plants, the ones that are well researched and used, um, they um, we have retention data on those uh, over, I think, three or four years now, on um, these less limited platforms. So we know very well how they um, respond. And um, when it comes to detention, it doesn't really matter what type of vegetation you put on there. You can theoretically also put stones on top of there and the detention system will still work. Um, but uh, when it comes to retention and reducing the, the actual runoff over the course of a year, um, then, of course, uh, it matters what kind of uh, the transpiration rates the plants have and et cetera, et cetera. So, so now um, most... Most sedum roofs um, will not require any irrigation at all in in northern Europe or in central. I know in Germany as well they don't require any irrigation. They survive the summer there. They can survive on, on very very low levels of, of water. Now um, there's, this is also where we come back to where, where it's important to to talk to to, to clients why they want to build the roof. Now, if they want to build a roof for for um, uh, for for lead purposes, or maybe, uh, or or uh, if they want to have still a really high retention capacity of cooling a building or something, then um, then of course uh, you need the plants to be green and actually evapotranspire throughout the summer. So uh, that means that even you, you even though the plants would survive without water, um, they would not cool the roof that much uh, because they wouldn't really evapotranspire very high during the summer. So so if you wanna if you just wanna have the roof for aesthetic purposes, I don't think you'd need irrigation, but if you really want it to to flourish and uh look good also in in the hot weeks of summer and also perform optimally uh, with high evapotranspiration rate, it might be a good idea to put in like a a, a drip irrigation system. But it it, it doesn't n- it's not necessary for the survival of the roof. That's what I'm trying to say. It just depends a little bit on what you want the roof to perform and how you want it to perform. That that's basically the 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 caveat um, that you need to understand before you uh, before you build it and then be clear about. You mentioned stones actually, and I did wonder: are green roofs always the best solution? A green roof um, might not always be the best solution. I think. I think we need to be very, very clear um, because it depends on what problem or what wishes the client has. So now, if if uh, you, and for that, you need to look at at the client's uh, budget restrictions, and you need to look at you know what why do they want to build the roof. So now, um, of course, if you want to have like proper stormwater management. Um, a green roof with a detention capacity would be the best solution because then you get both retention and detention. Now, if you put like um, some other material on the roof and and just basically um, use a sort of a detention system uh, underneath it, so you can slow down water, but you won't really 
um, you wouldn't really evaporate water in, in, in that way because you won't have the transpiration um, effect. So you, you'll still have like 100% of the runoff coming off the roof, like a bare roof, just a little bit, like just in delayed um, outflow. So um, if you want like proper stormwater management, you, you will need that greenery as well. But uh, what you can do with, uh, with these detention systems is that you, you don't have to green. I mean, you can never green uh, completely 100% of the roof off. And you have like at the edging, you have some, some stones, or you have like maybe you have um, equipment on the roof as well where you can't like green underneath. Um, but you can still have the detention systems underneath those, uh, those areas. So the roof can be like 100% detention system, but then you have maybe um, 80% greenery or 70% greenery uh, that basically has retention capacity. So, so that that's how you can put it together, or you can have maybe have a building with several different types of of roofs, and um, you might have a, a roof on top, which is basically some some equipment, and maybe you just have some some uh, just. Just some some rocks, some 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 white rocks, or some some cover there, and this uh, runs off to another roof, which which might be uh, one of those um, detention roof system, like for example the, the non-proprietary uh, concept called purple roof that uh, has this kind of capacity. You can um, and and they can also be installed on slightly sloped roofs, um, and then maybe this uh, roof runs down on on a blue green roof, which is basically a nice lush garden uh, that can basically store the water. Uh, properly, like uh, almost like a small. Um, well, they they can store like several centimeters of water basically underneath the green roof and use that for for irrigation. So that's a blue green type roof. But then you need to have a completely flat deck, and then this can uh, can run down on a on a kind of maybe a traditional type green roof, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can have all these different systems in 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 a chain as well, and uh, you know mixing stones and mixing greens and, and different types of green roofs. So. So you can, in the end, uh, create a kind of a nice system uh, for the building that basically with with the aim that as little um, water as possible hits the street and all the water is basically used to to uh, irrigate and, and cool and etc. So that's basically my, my sort of like utopic idea of how, how, uh, how things can work. And for that, we need different types of green roof systems and and I'm happy that the market um, provides different types of systems that would be, that are suitable for these different different aspects. Basically, yeah. So you can slow the water, the, the movement of water down, but the plants really are quite key in terms of cooling effect. Um, I wondered who is leading the way. Are there any countries that are really undertaking pioneering work in the world of green roofs? Um. I think there's uh, there's good work done in, in many countries. I'm, I'm, uh, I normally live in, in Germany, so um, the German uh, green roof uh, market has, has been going on for many years. But but there are there are individuals I think I would see like um, really um, uh, Im- important souls <laughs> in in many different countries. And and I'm I'm meeting a, a company now on Thursday here in Sweden that are uh, doing some. Some interesting work here, and then there are some um, in Swedish. You say like fire souls that <laughs> really work for certain topics. Like we have uh, Dusty Gedge, for example, in the UK, who's working uh, very, very, uh, re- uh, working relentlessly for for biodiverse green roofs. And then we have um, uh, Brad Garner and, and uh, I think Oscar Oscar Warmerdam as well in, in the US that uh, really. Um, yeah, really come with uh, novel and uh, innovative ideas, um, and are very data driven as well. So, but there are there are many uh, many uh, many companies. I think I think also the the energy modeling of uh, urbanscape is uh, is is quite uh, together with the University of Ljubljana. There's something that I, um, I would like to mention as well as uh, as very interesting and. Uh, there's uh, the the tools that I need to actually mention are our own tools as well that I think are quite uh, quite interesting for people to know of. They're therefore they were developed uh, for um, for the Purple Roof website, so they can be found there. Um, but that's basically you can go in there for free and just click on your climate and see um, toggle a little bit uh, the different profiles and uh, and see basically how you can uh, build your uh, the optimal green roof for for your um, for your climate. And 
Now we also have a detention modeler that, uh, but that's behind the login still. Um, but uh, if if anyone would be interested to take a look at it, and uh, people can contact uh, Green Roof Diagnostics as well to take a look at that, and that basically can can model all these like chain reactions through building through different roofs, and then see what um, what the end runoff would be, how how much uh, the system would retain, and how much it will detain, and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then. Uh, as as our research progresses, we'll add different aspects. You know, hopefully, we'll add like nutrient aspect to it, um, and etc. Uh, in the future, um, so we have large uh, research projects ahead. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And my last question is: um, Is there anything exciting that you can see in the future of green roofs? You know, what what is the direction people are taking them in? Well, I see a lot of exciting things. Um, um, something that makes me very very happy is see that uh, there's more there's more data coming in uh, great uh, research teams working on on these topics um, Elizabeth Batman Beck for example or Virginia Stovin uh, and many more I, I should maybe not start mentioning names because then, then I forget somebody but uh, there's there's some great research coming up and uh, great development of new products um, I'm really really happy to see the diversity of uh, of the green roof industry as well, and I think that this diversity will basically mean that um, the, the more um, the more like variation we we can uh, we can get, and and if we can have it really properly databased and be very very clear on what problems these particular roofs can solve for you and in which budget we would be if we installed them, I think that would help uh, green roofs in general to be. Um, um, uh, there, will, there will basically be more green roofs built in general, and I think I am personally very convinced that like nature-based solutions like these are the key for basically uh, creating livable and sustainable and resilient cities for for the future. So I, um, you know, together with other other ways to green cities, so creating clever park systems like they do in in Holland, for example, with a lot of parks also are. Access rain gardens and and etc. And they they have fantastic landscape architects. Uh, I think there's one one in Edinburgh as well. Some some fantastic rain garden that was created there um, that I've seen pictures of. Um, but I think this 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 greening of of our urban environment is just so important for for humanity over the years to come. And in any ways we can achieve that, um, that is something that I would be very very happy to. <laughs> to work with and support so um and uh, happen to work in the, with the green roofs and um i'm yeah happy i'm happy to do that there are lots of instances in horticulture where gardeners and designers base decisions on outdated information or on good old instinct because the data isn't available upon which to make good judgments so the work done by people like anna is super important if we want to proceed in the most informed way thank you to anna for taking part in the interview and thanks to you for listening and learning along with me. I'll leave you with Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug with a taste for onions. Since first being detected in Britain during 2002, the Allium leaf miner fly has become a major problem for Allium growers throughout most of England and Wales. Onions, chives, leeks, garlic and shallots are all at risk from this serious pest. And once infested with its maggoty larvae, there's nothing that can be done to control it. The problem starts when the adult flies land on the alliums during early spring and begin puncturing the leaves to feed on the sap. They then start to lay their eggs within the puncture holes, which soon hatch into tiny white maggots. The maggots begin tunnelling within the leaves, feeding on the cells and creating mines that allow fungal and bacterial rots to set in. Before long, the allium is wilting and starts to die. By this time, the maggots have reached maturity and will turn into pupae either within the allium stem or the surrounding soil. From these, the second generation adults hatch during mid to late autumn and repeat the egg laying cycle. The resulting pupae then overwinter and hatch the following spring. Since there's nothing that can be done to control the maggots, other than destroying the infested plant, it's important to make sure the adult flies can't lay their eggs on the alliums in the first place. So alliums should therefore be planted in a location where mining flies have not previously occurred and should be grown under a fine mesh netting or horticultural fleece.
You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All. Roots and All.